Welcome, a warm welcome to today's event, Conversations with the Survivor, in honor of Holocaust Remembrance Day. The Intercultural Exchange Club leaders here at Chandler Gilbert Community College have taken the heartwarming initiative to plan and host today's event for you. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Chandler Gilbert Community College student, Intercultural Exchange Club co-chair, and wonderful student leader, Shai Lee, who will be our MC for today's event. Welcome, Shai Lee. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. And welcome to a conversation with a survivor. My grandfather was a Holocaust survivor. When I moved to Arizona a year ago, he made me promise that next time we'll meet at Passover, we will write a book about his life. He always said that as time passes, the living evidence of the Holocaust continued to, to decrease as survivors get older and pass away. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic started and my grandfather cannot come to visit. He passed away three months ago before I had the opportunity to write his story. We are the last generation that can hear and learn from someone that was there. In these confusing times, we have to take the responsibility to continue the legacies in our hearts and minds. This is an open conversation. Any question you have, don't be shy to ask. Our guest encourages you to ask complicated questions because soon there will be no one to answer. Please leave your questions in the comment section. There will be no tolerance to disrespecting comments and statements, but any question is welcome. I want to welcome Joel Lassman from the Phoenix Holocaust Association. Thank you, Shaili. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joel Lassman, and I will be introducing your speaker today. Uh, before I do so, I'd like to give a little background, though, on the organization to which we both belong, the Phoenix Holocaust Association. The Phoenix Holocaust Association was founded in the greater Phoenix area 36 years ago to facilitate and promote education related to the Holocaust. Our members include Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, children and grandchildren of survivors, and individuals who support our mission and our purpose. We honor the memory and the legacy of both victims and survivors by promoting awareness of the Holocaust and providing associated educational material and talks as well as describing other genocides that have occurred throughout history and continue even into today. An integral part of the Phoenix Holocaust Association is the Speakers Bureau, of which I am the coordinator. It is comprised of survivors and descendants of survivors who speak about their experiences and share their stories with many different audiences throughout the greater Phoenix area. The historical significance of the Holocaust and its relevance to recent and current genocides is extremely important today and will continue to be important well into the future. Survivor stories are all different, as George will tell you, but all provide valuable insight into how hatred and intolerance have affected their lives. Additionally, Experiences from descendants like myself give fascinating insight into what it was like to grow up in the shadows of the Holocaust. Their stories also offer powerful messages about perseverance, determination, and the strength of the human spirit. It is my honor to introduce your speaker today, George Coleman, a Holocaust survivor. Go ahead, George. Hi, my name is George. I am a Holocaust survivor. More precisely, I am a forced slave labor camp Holocaust survivor. I was in concentration camp for 10 months. I will talk to you about myself for three minutes. And after that, we are going to talk to each other. You ask questions and I ask questions. 
and we will just talk whatever happens to your mind ask the questions what kind of questions can you ask any any question is okay it can be personal question about me and my experience what i learned what I, my beliefs are anything anything whatever you want to know everything is great just ask the questions and don't be shy please i like hostile questions i like questions like i heard that the holocaust never happened how come what is happening great that is a great question we have a chance now to talk about it and we should talk about those questions that are not comfortable those are the important ones that we can do it right now so i was born in hungary 1934 so i'm 86 years old in hungary was an ally of germany so hungary was not deporting jews for quite late in march 19 1944 now if you remember now march 19 1944 that's very getting very close to d-day that was already the fourth year of the war that was the time when germany invaded hungary militarily and that's when the deportation started. Me, my mother and my grandfather along with 80 people from the village were put into a cattle car and transported, deported first to a collection camp, then to a distribution camp, and then finally to a labor camp in Austria. I'm ready for your questions. This this is the basics. Ask the questions, whatever you want. Go ahead. Okay, so let's see. Let's start with the first question. Some people say that the Holocaust never happened. Can you speak about about this a little bit? Okay. There are two kinds of people who say that. One of them who I heard that and it just doesn't make any sense and they want to know more about it. And I love to talk, discussion, whatever the question has says and whatever proof there is for it besides the people uh, statement only those who went through it because there are other documentation there is a very interesting one in Bad Arsen in Germany who has the deposition for Second World War not just Jews but everything about the Second World War and they have like three ring binders, actually they are four ring binders with different shapes on shelves. Big binders on shelves. And if you put the shelves together, it is 16 miles long. So you can imagine how much information is kept by the Germans. So those are not something which you can say is Jewish propaganda. These people who want to know more about that, I am glad to talk about it. There are other people who are the set of my mind that the Holocaust never happened. And there is asking for information. And this 16 mile long German documentation is not enough for them. They want more. Well, for those, I, there is nothing 
that I can say that will be enough for them. They will believe that the Holocaust never happened. And so be it. Okay. Okay. Um, next question. Did you ever ask why me? Did you, did I ever ask what? Why me? Why did it happen to me? Why did it happen to me? It didn't happen to me. It happened to six million people who were dead and those who are survived. So it's not just me. Uh, one thing when you're learning about the Holocaust, and one of my questions will be later asking, why are you learning about the Holocaust? Why are you studying? But one of the reasons that they, one of the things that they don't emphasize, the Holocaust was not one horrible single event. It was one big horrible but it was not a single event. It was different from place to place to place, and it was different from time to time to time. It was different in Germany than Hungary and in different than Poland and different than Romania. And it was different in March 15 in Hungary than March 19th in Hungary. Same thing. And it was different in the city than in the village. So if we are talking about the Holocaust, we have to be careful to understand that it is not a single event. Here I want to ask a question because I don't want to miss that. When you hear Holocaust and you hear about concentration camp, how many concentration camp were there through all through the Holocaust. Can you guess? Anybody can guess that. You have to guess it because you probably don't know. I didn't know that. I know that there were a lot. I know that there were six extermination camps in Poland, but I don't know how, concent, how many concentration camps there were. I'm talking about concentration camps only, not ghettos just labor camps where we were prisoners. How many of those were? I don't know. <laughs> 1,600. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. A, a lot, lot of them. <laughs> yeah. I have a map of them. It was interesting because people don't know and they don't understand it that most of the camps were not murder camps. People heard about Sobibor and Auschwitz and Dachau and the other murder camps, but there were other 1,600 that were not murder camps. And the question is what would they were and so on. So if you have question about that, please ask. So we have the next question is, can you still remember how the Nazis treated you? Say that again, please. Can you remember how the Nazis treated you? Uh, yes, I, I can remember that. And there is again an important information that I would like to tell you because it is not told well. Not all the Nazis were bad. There were many of them. No shortage of the cruel, nasty, really cruel Nazis, but they were also very decent people. Nazis who were not cruel, who helped me, who helped my mother and who helped my grandfather. So I have to, have to make sure that we don't use a very big, wide brush and all Nazis are bad. Not true. When you say that they I, helped your family, how did that help? I, my 
uh, experience were very little with the Germans. The Hungarian Nazis, uh, yes, I do. I was kicked out from third grade in elementary school because Jews were not allowed to be in school. Okay. Um, quest, next question. How do you see history possibly repeating itself? How do I say that again? How do you see history possibly repeating itself? Sorry, I don't understand the question. Don't you said well. in the beginning that you are trying to educate people to stop history to repeat itself. So how do you see it possible? Uh, I was asked by a friend, an, Aus an Auschwitz survivor from the same village where I was born and grew up to help out. And I went to a school and talked to the students. And then she asked me again to help out and did it again. And for 20 years, I am doing that, I'm going to schools and senior groups and anybody else who wants to learn about the Holocaust because they need to know. Everybody needs to know why. This is my question I said I will ask. Why are you studying the Holocaust? When you are studying arithmetics, I can understand that is benefiting you because you go shopping and you can count the change. When you learn physics, I can understand how it does benefit you because again, you can fix some switches of the house or maybe work on your car. Chemistry, again, when you burn the meat or you burn the evening dinner, you know what you did and you understand it. So it is beneficial. But studying the Holocaust, what good does it do to you? Anybody would like to say something on that? Um, I don't see any of the comments about this. Okay. But we have another question. Okay, then let me tell you why. Okay. It doesn't seem to be very relevant right now because you feel safe. But that safety is not guaranteed. If you don't know what happened on the Holocaust, you cannot be prepared the eventuality that it can happen to you too. You yeah. are not immune. Nobody is immune. It can happen everywhere. It can happen to everybody. So that's why you have to learn about it, to know something about it, that you don't fool yourself that you are immune. Okay. Okay. Um, now the next question. Um, did you lose hope during the Holocaust? Hope was always there, but hope gradually went less and less and less. Then it became hopeless when we were shoved, 81 of us, into a cattle car. I don't know if you are familiar with the cattle car, there is one here in Phoenix, and when there is a meeting, sometimes the cattle car is brought off so you can see it. That was used for the deportation for the Jews to the concentration camps, collection camps, murder camps, everywhere else. And when we were shoved, 81 of us into the cattle car, where there was not enough room to sit down, where there was no bathroom, there was a bucket for 81 people. 
there was no food, no water, and mostly for us, there was no air. It was suffocating hot, suffocating. Hungary was pretty hot in the spring when we were deported. Not as hot as Phoenix, but it was really, really hot. And when the railway cars were shut down, there was no air to breathe. That was the time when the last hope was gone. How did you get it back? I don't think we got it back. Okay. Um, our next question is, what is your perspective to the concentration camps in Xinjiang? Um, I'm sorry if I can't read it right. Um, I will go to the next question. Uh, did you go to many different concentration camps? Yes, the first camp was from the village on the cattle car into the Sordo, which was a sugar factory. And we were there as a collection camp out in the yards of the sugar factory, because sugar factory was only later in the fall. And there was no, use, no other use for the, this uh, yard. And it was raining and we were sleeping in the mud. That was the first camp. From there on, again, a couple of weeks later, we were put in other cattle car. We were transported, deported from Hungary to Strasbourg, Austria, which was a distribution camp. That trip was a day and a half long, logged into the cattle car with again, no food, no water, no bathroom. Actually, the, the bucket was overflowing, stinky. And uh, no air. The, the biggest one was the suffocating. And from Strasbourg, we were transported, and I don't remember how we were transported, whether it was truck or something else, to the labor camp, the slave labor camp called Neudorf, N-E-U-D-O-R-F, which was a village in Austria and we were put to work there in the labor field. We were very lucky because in Hungary, where we lived, was a very primitive area and we were able to, we were farming, gardening. We knew how to handle animals, cows and cattle and pigs and so on. So they could put us to use for the farmers there who were shortage of labor because they were, the men were out in the Russian front. So they needed the labor. But the main reason why the, we were put into that concentration camp, because they could not murder that many people fast enough. So part of our group was put into Auschwitz and never returned, and part of the group was put into uh, these 1,600 labor camps. Is, is that answering the question? I don't think this is a, this is comes very clearly from the, the studies. No, this is a very good answer. Um, there is a question here, how did it feel to be tattooed with a number? But I, I believe that you don't have a tattoo with a number, right? What, what not? Tattooing One numbers? question, 
Oh, one question. Oh, one. good, good, good. That, that's, that's a really good question because I get into trouble with that with American Jews who believe that everybody had tattooed and that is not the case. There were two camps. One of them that they know about it and most people know about it is Auschwitz where people get tattooed. There was an other camp, a small camp in Austria that also put tattoos on the prisoners, but the other 1,600 or so did not. So I did not have tattoos. And some people are accusing me that I am making it up, the story, because I don't have tattoos, so I don't have a proof. Um, I was I was warned about that. That's gonna happen. <laughs> I I knew because you said you weren't in Auschwitz. I didn't know. I knew. I didn't know about another camp that was tattooing. So I learned something new. Auschwitz was doing tattoos, but the others did not. Okay. Um. The next question. Um, during the time in the camps and afterward, if as a child you ex express the time of your life through writing or other forms of art, did you ex uh, did you uh, use art to express your experience of the no. Holocaust? No art. No, no writing. No writing. Okay. Um, how do you feel when you meet a German today? Do you feel angry? Not against the German. I don't have any bad feeling. My mother was assigned to be a maid to a high-ranking Nazi official in Nordorf. That sounds scary, isn't it? This high-ranking Nazi official was very, very nice to my mother and very nice to me and my grandfather and the other people. We were only 35 people in that camp. We didn't have guards, we didn't have barbed wires, we didn't have dogs. That was also true for many of the other 1,600 camps. Not all of them had guards and we are just prisoners. And this high-ranking Nazi Germany official and his family was very nice. Now, I was, or we were lucky because my mother grew up in Austria about 40 miles from where the camp was. And her mother tongue was German. So she spoke fluent German with the same dialect, with the same accent as the local people. And she knew everything, the schools, the diet. She was an excellent housewife, an excellent cook. So the, she, the, the German Nazi and family benefited by her to be there because she took care of the kitchen. She also was a seamstress and she could mend the clothes because there was shortage. By that time, there was shortage in Germany, in Austria, in everything. So she, they were nice, but they, they really benefited my mother being there too. And so did the farmers where the rest of the group was working. Um, next question is, what social, economic, economic and political condition prompted the Holocaust in Europe? Sorry, I, I have not to understand. What social, economic and political condition prompted the Holocaust in Europe? Thank <laughs> you. 
somebody had to be blamed, right? Things were not well. And have you seen ever a politician to stand up and say, hey, don't blame him, I screwed up. I don't think you ever seen a politician to say that, do you? Right. I don't think you ever see a politician to do that either, ever. But they have to be blaming somewhere. And that is always the case with minorities, especially those are who can be identified by some means to be different that they are the one who creating all the problems. Anti-Semitism is not new. It was there in Hungary before Hitler came onto the sphere. In Hungary, there is anti-Semitism right now. And I believe that anti-Semitism will stay in Hungary because Jews are different. And gypsies are different too. So there are this anti-Semitic, anti-gypsy, uh, anti-Romanian, anti-Slovak, anti-anti-anti sentiment in Hungary right today. And I don't think it is only in Hungary. I cannot talk about the others because I don't have first-hand knowledge but I know this from Hungary. Um, the next question. Were there any towns or communities that were able to resist the Nazis? And if so, how? That was excellent question because the answer is no. The military age men, like my father and my uncles, were conscripted in Hungary. I talk about now in Hungary only, not from the other places. They were conscripted in slave military service two years before deportation started. So I saw my father last when I was seven years old. When I was nine years old, I was put into the cattle car with my mother and grandfather. And uh, I was 10 years old on April 2nd, 1944, morning 10 o'clock when the first Red Army Russian soldiers came into the camp and we were liberated. As far as deportation was, deportation was only old people, children and women from Hungary again, because my father and the military age people were already separated. And of course, old people, children and women cannot do much res uh, resistance. And they were afraid to. That's the truth. Even if they would have a chance, they probably would not have done so. Um, okay. Thank you. The next question. What was the feeling when everything was over and you were able to continue your life normally? Well, that was a question because we were in Austria, we were not in Hungary. And most of the people didn't speak German. My mother did and there were a few people who also did. But we, could, we couldn't stay there. We didn't want to stay there. We wanted to go back to the village where I was born, because that was the only way where we could get together with the people who might survive. We did not know how bad the situation was. 
we didn't know how lucky we were by comparison. We learned that only years later, when people came back from Auschwitz and the other concentration camp, and we learned it from them. What did they have to? So we went back to the village, and one of my uncles, who was in the military slave labor, survived, and he was liberated earlier than we did, and he was in the village. But my father and my other uncle did not survive and didn't return. Neither is my aunt and her whole family, and my other aunt, her whole family, who were li living in Bratislava now. It was Pozhen there, it was a Hungarian city. And uh, my mother had four, was four. My grandfather has four daughters, my mother was the youngest. The next one is Fanny, uh, lived in England, so she was out of the reach of the German, and she survived in, in England with her daughter. But the rest of the family were all murdered. Um, so how was the feeling then when you, when you were li liberated? How did you feel when you were liberated from the camp? We, how, how did we feel? Elated, ecstatic, liberated, physically and mentally too. Um, the next question, how can a community protect against propaganda? How, what was how, how can a community co protect against propaganda? That is up to you students. I cannot tell him how. They have to figure out to able to be aware of what is going on here and everywhere else in the world and be able to listen carefully and understand if they catch one thing that doesn't make sense, ask questions. And if they have several questions, several things that doesn't make sense, don't believe in it. It's better to start not to believe politicians in either side. Um. But that, that is a really hard question because they have to train young themselves to listen very carefully what they say. Like one of the guy said, you know, I never did that. I promise I never do it again. Huh? You never did it and don't do it again. You gave it away. You lied. You lost your credibility. Don't believe anything ever again what he says. So these are the little things you can catch, but you have to watch out for it. Um, the next question. What do you have to say to those non-Jews that helped and hid your fellow Jews? There were non-Jews, mostly Christians, Catholics and Protestants, who were helpful. We were not separated in the village. We lived together side by side with, with everybody else, and we were part of the society. And uh, most of them, local people, who were friends, essentially. They were not. They maybe had anti-Semitic upbringing because of the churches where propaganda was strong. But 
they said that these are the good Jews, the neighbors, but those are the others, the other Jews whom I don't know, those are the bad ones. This is the way propaganda works the best. The people I know, those are good. The people I don't know, those are bad. So the question is, what do you think or what do you have to say to those non-Jews, the Christians or Protestants that helped during the Holocaust to save Jews, that kept them hidden from the Nazis? No, those, those Christians who have Jews usually had Jewish friends. They were not strangers. They were not those who are the bad ones. Those are the ones that they knew. Those are when, even if they were in the same trade, like my father, my father was a butcher, and they were about seven or eight butchers in the village. So there was competition, but it was fair. It was fair competition and there was no animosity against each other. Did they benefit when my father's butcher shop was closed down? Yes, they did benefit. Okay. Um, the next question is, what, what was the hardest challenge you faced at the concentration camp? The hardest part was not in the concentration camp. The concentration camp was in a village and the local people were not allowed to talk to us except telling what to do, where to go, when to do it. But there was not allowed to have social interaction and we were not allowed to have talking to them either, that was forbidden. And it was checked too by the authorities. Nevertheless, there were people who still did talk to us socially. There was the butcher, Herr Ryman, who learned that my father was a butcher and sometimes he slipped me a piece of sausage, a slice of bread. So he was nice. He was a Nazi too, and he was nice. And I thought, of course, I talked to him about uh, Buchinger, who was also very nice and very nice people. Uh, those people who are were Nazis and hated the Jews, I think they will hate it now too. Um, the next question, was your camp liberated by the Soviet troops or the U.S. Army? Did you see any of the soldiers? No, we were liberated by the Russian Red Army. Of course, they, we didn't speak Russian and they didn't speak Hungarian or German. And some of the people who lived under control of uh, Czechoslovakia before they became Hungary and know some Slovak, they tried to talk Slovak to the Russians, which is civil, it's a Slavic language, not much use. But we didn't have much contact with the Russians. Um. What advice can you give to the to our generation? Could you say it again, please? What advice can you give to our generation? What advice do I give to students? Uh, nobody can tell them how to be careful and how to be aware of things what's happening. 
what they hear on the TV, what they read on the internet or the newspaper is probably half true, half false. Now they are smart if they can figure out that. But they are genius if they can figure out which half of the truth and which half of the false. That needs a genius to do that because propaganda is very, very strong and they have to learn themselves. Nobody can teach them to sort out what is the truth and what is false. Thank you. Um, not an easy job. No. <laughs> That's not an easy job. No. But they have to do it. Nobody can do it for them. That's true. Um, the next question is, which chateau were you from? Which what? Chateau, chateau where are you from? Chateau? It was not a chateau. Chateau was a different part of Europe. It was in Russia and Ukraine mainly. In Hungary, we lived, lived together with everybody. My left, hand, left side neighbor was a Catholic lawyer. My right side neighbor was a Protestant doctor. And we were in between the two and uh, we lived harmoniously together. My father was playing in the lo local soccer team for soccer in Hungary was the biggest game. And he loved soccer and he played soccer every Sunday. Uh, we lived together very harmoniously in the village. They were anti-Semites and nasty people. There were not that many. Okay. Um, how did you, it feel to move to another country? To live in another country? Well, I lived in Hungary. Then I lived in Austria, in, mainly in Vienna. I uh, lived in uh, Canada because from, uh, okay, let me go back a little bit. Can I? Hungary became a communist country soon after the war ended. And the Russians occupied Hungary and Russian put it a communist, Hungarian communist uh, dictatorship government. You probably heard about the Berlin Wall, that they had guards and machine gun posts and minefields and nobody can escape from Germany. The same thing was true in Hungary too. People didn't hear about it that much because Hungary was not an easy place to go to the West anyhow. But Hungary also had machine gun posts and barbed wires and minefields all around the country. And the rabbit couldn't escape from there. If the rabbit wanted to go through, the rabbit blew up or get shot. Nobody could escape from Hungary. Then in 1956 October, there was a revolution against the Hungarian communist system. And because of the revolution, the border guards who manned the machine gun post disappeared. They, they just left. And we could escape. And that was in 1956 when I and my stepsister escaped and we went west, we went to Austria. And from Austria, I wanted to come to the United States, but I was told that it will take security check of six months to six years. Six years waiting 
to somebody say no. No, that's I didn't didn't want that. I had a scholarship given by Sweden, but learning another language that is spoken by 10 million people total, that was not my idea. I wanted to learn either English or French or German or anything that is used worldwide, not something that is used by very few people. Canada, on the other hand, had a different way of getting people. We were, I was a part of a student group. We were young and not married and we could move and go anywhere we wanted. We had nothing except the shirt on their back. And Canada said, we need young people like you. Come to Canada, learn French or learn English because Canada is bilingual, both French and English. Finish school and be part of the Canadian society. So I went to Canada with many other students and uh, started to learn English, which was tough. <laughs> English is really tough. I could say bonjour and bonsoir. I couldn't say that much in English. So learning English was not easy, not at all. We didn't learn English in school. We learned Russian in school, but uh, that was compulsory. And uh, I got a Canadian citizenship, so went to school, get, get my degree. Uh, in 1968, I get an offer from Westinghouse Semiconductor in Baltimore, Maryland, actually. And uh, in six, 1968, we moved. I moved, we moved. By that time, I was married, no children. We moved to the United States. Um, we have time for just one more question. Um, let's see. Were you able to pray and keep kosher in the camp? If yes, how? And if not, how did, did that make you feel? I feel horrible because my mother was very religious and very knowledgeable education wise. She spoke Hebrew and she kept a kosher home and kept all the holidays. And when situation got that we couldn't get any kosher food or hardly any food, then my mother got together the family, and she said a prayer. Says, God, thank you very much. You made me do this. I did not want to eat non kosher food. You, my God, made me do that. I cannot forgive you for that, God. How did this make you feel? My mother did not keep kosher ever since. Um, the next question. So many survivors had no place to go and nothing to start with. How did you overcome this? No place to go? Well, yes. Yeah. Probably that the survivors, many of them who were not stuck in Russia or the Ukraine, had managed to go somewhere from those people who are Poland and who were expelled from Poland later on, after the Holocaust later, or people from Germany and people from Belgium and uh, everywhere else. 
managed to get to Canada, to South America, to Israel, when, when it was already open. And to any, anywhere else. So uh, after the Hungarian Revolution, we had a chance to those people who wanted to escape, we could escape, and we did. Um, the next question will be Now, during the Holocaust was different because during the Holocaust, no countries except Jewish refugees. During the Holocaust, you couldn't go to the US, couldn't go to Canada, couldn't go to South America, couldn't go to Africa, couldn't go anywhere. Nobody except the Jews. Not during the Holocaust, the Jews won. If they could escape, they had nowhere to go. Probably that was the real question. Not that those who have survived, but those who could have gone somewhere during the Holocaust. I think that was the real question. Yeah. Um, so we will end with this one. Um, how I can learn more and educate myself more about the Holocaust? The best thing that you still have, some people who went through the Holocaust and talk with them, ask questions. And they, I, the people I am associated with, we answer any questions anytime. And if we don't know, we say so too. We don't know everything, but we learn quite a bit since then too, from other survivors, and we were willing to share that one if uh, we are asked. If we don't ask, then we cannot say it. I am not pushing the fact that well, I am a Holocaust survivor. Most of the neighbors don't know that, because I, if it comes out, yes, but if it doesn't come out, that is not something that I talk about. Um, so I, before we go and we finish this event, I want to ask you if you have any other comments that you want to share with the students before we finish. No, not really. If they have some questions, they can write to me or phone me or all kinds of other things. Uh, I am available and we are glad to talk with them. Okay. I want to thank you very much, George, for this event and uh, it, for you for telling us and educating us. Um, and thank you for everything today that you were able, able to share. Um, and I want to thank you, all my fellow students, for coming and participating today. Um, and that's it. I hope you will have a great day, George. Thank you very much.